The day is day two for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 23rd through the 29th. First and second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, be thou an example of the believers. Tuesday, October 24th, 2023, First Timothy 2 and 3. Paul taught about the need for prayer and proper worship. He taught that Jesus Christ is the ransom for all and is our mediator with the Father. He instructed men and women how to conduct themselves during worship and outlined the qualifications for bishops and deacons. Paul also explained the mystery of godliness as being the condescension of Jesus Christ, his perfect life on earth, and his ascension to glory. Christ ordained to be a mediator. 1 Timothy 2, 1-2 I exhort, therefore, that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty or dignity and gravity. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, said, an apt summary of the purpose of life while in mortality, a state possible only when there is peace among men and nations. 1 Timothy 2.3 For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to God our Savior, said, Christ. 1 Timothy 2.4 Who is willing to have, or desires, all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, which is in Christ Jesus, who is the only begotten Son of God, and ordained to be a mediator between God and man, who is one God, and hath power over all men? Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to ordained to be a mediator, said, As Moses was the mediator of the Old Covenant or Testament, so Jesus is the mediator of the New Covenant or Testament. Look to the great mediator, Lehi said, and hearken unto his great commandments, and be faithful unto his words, and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit. Our Lord's mission was to bring to pass the great mediation of all men, meaning that in his capacity as mediator, he had power to intervene between God and man and effect a reconciliation. This mediation or reconciliation was effected through his atoning sacrifice, a sacrifice by means of which sinful men, by the proper use of agency, can wash away their guilt and place themselves in harmony with God. Men are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediation of all men or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. Those choosing obedience receive the Holy Ghost, are reconciled to God in this world, and continue in His presence in the world to come. 1 Timothy 2, 5-6 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Paul declared in 1 Timothy 2, 5-6 that Jesus Christ is our mediator with God. A mediator is one who intervenes between two parties, usually to restore peace and friendship. The Joseph Smith translation provides the insight that Jesus Christ was ordained to be a mediator between God and man. Because he took our sins upon himself, Jesus Christ can redeem us and reconcile our relationship with the Father, allowing us to return to his presence. Restored scripture attests that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He justifies men and women, and then perfects them. 1 Timothy 2, 7-8 Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles, in faith and verity, or truth. I will, or desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, or dispute, contention, or doubt. Paul speaks about dress of women. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Worldly styles and fashions in women's dress, whatever they happen to be at any moment, being of the world, which those who join the church are commanded to forsake, are improper and to be avoided. Almost always the apparel so involved is excessively costly, with those who wear it being lifted up in the pride of their hearts. The Nephite prophets repeatedly identified the wearing of costly clothing with apostasy and failure to live by gospel standards. The love of precious clothing is one of the desires of the great and abominable church. In this dispensation the Lord has commanded, Thou shalt not be proud in thy heart, let all thy garments be plain. 
and their beauty the beauty of the work of thine own hands. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness, or modesty, or reverence, and sobriety, not with broided, or plaited, or braided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Paul encouraged women to adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, meaning with humility and reverence. He also taught that women should avoid costly clothing and jewelry and ordinate grooming. Similar teachings are found in 1 Nephi 13, 7 through 8, 4 Nephi 1, 24, Mormon 8, 36 to 39, and Doctrine and Covenants 42, 40. Paul indicated that women should dress as those professing godliness. The principle of wearing modest clothing applies to both male and female members of the church today. Through your dress and appearance, you can show that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and that you love him. Prophets of God have continually counseled his children to dress modestly. When you are well-groomed and modestly dressed, you invite the companionship of the Spirit and you can be a good influence on others. What does it mean to adorn yourselves with good works? What are some good works our family could do this week? You might sing together a song about doing good, such as, Have I Done Any Good? Hymn number 223. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority, or exercise dominion, or be autocratic or domineer over the man, but to be in silence, or quietness and tranquility. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, In the true order of government, man, not woman, is the head of the house and of the church. She is and should be in subjection to her husband. In Paul's day, the social custom extended this rule to the point of keeping women from teaching the, in the church. In 1 Timothy 2, 11-12, Paul said, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach. Some women have taken these verses to mean that women were not allowed to speak in church in Paul's day. However, this recommendation that women learn in silence may have been an effort to correct a specific problem where some women were usurping the authority of church leaders. President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught about the valuable roles that women have in the church. Every sister in this church who has made covenants with the Lord has a divine mandate to help save souls, to lead the women of the world, to strengthen the homes of Zion, and to build the kingdom of God. Sister Eliza R. Snow, the second general president of the Relief Society, said that every sister in this church should be a preacher of righteousness because we have greater and higher privileges than any other females upon the face of the earth. 1 Timothy 2, 13-14 for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. In this discussion of the role of women in 1 Timothy 2, 9-15, Paul wrote that Eve transgressed because she was deceived. This was in reference to the fact that Eve was the first to partake of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Rather than being criticized, Eve should be honored for her bold willingness to initiate mortality for all humankind. The Greek text of 1 Timothy 2.14 suggests that Paul believed Eve's transgression consisted in her overstepping her bounds by usurping authority to make a decision that affected both herself and Adam. The Greek word parabasis, translated in this verse as transgression, means literally to overstep. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency discussed Eve's decision to eat the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. It was Eve who first transgressed the limits of Eden in order to initiate the conditions of mortality. Her act, whatever its nature, was formally a transgression, but eternally a glorious necessity to open the doorway toward eternal life. Adam showed his wisdom by doing the same, and thus Eve and Adam fell that man might be. Some Christians condemn Eve for her act, concluding that she and her daughters are somehow flawed by it, not the Latter-day Saints. Informed by Revelation, we celebrate Eve's act and honor her wisdom and courage in the great episode called The Fall. Joseph Smith taught that it was not a sin because God had decreed it. 
Modern revelation shows that our first parents understood the necessity of the fall. Adam declared, Blessed be the name of God, for because of my transgression my eyes are opened, and in this life I shall have joy, and again in the flesh I shall see God. Note the different perspective and the special wisdom of Eve, who focused on the purpose and effect of the great plan of, of happiness. Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed, and never should have known good from evil, and the joy of our redemption, and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. In his vision of the redemption of the dead, President Joseph F. Smith saw the great and mighty ones assembled to meet the Son of God, and among them was our glorious Mother Eve. 1 Timothy 2.15 Notwithstanding, they shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety or modesty. Paul speaketh of bishops. 1 Timothy 3.1 This is a true saying, if a man desired the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to bishop, said, One of the ordained offices of the Aaronic priesthood is that of bishop. Those so ordained and set apart to serve either in the pre presiding bishopric or as ward bishops are called to preside over the Aaronic priesthood. A ward bishop is the president of the Aaronic priesthood in his ward and is also the president of the priest's quorum. The office of a bishop is also an appendage belonging unto the high priesthood. In his Aaronic priesthood capability, a bishop deals primarily with temporal concerns. As the presiding high priest in his ward, however, he presides over all ward affairs and members. A bishop is a common judge in Israel. It is his right to have the gift of discernment, the power to discern all other spiritual gifts, lest there shall be any among you professing, and yet be not God. 1 Timothy 3.2 a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, or temperate or circumspect, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to husband of one wife, said, From the day of Adam to the present, and from this hour to the end of the peopling of the world, the law of God has been, is, and shall be, that man should have one wife at a time and one wife only, except when God, by revelation, specifically directs otherwise. Thus, in March of 1831, the Lord said to Joseph Smith, It is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, and all this, that the earth might answer the end of its creation, and that it might be filled with the measure of man, according to his creation, before the world was made. Thus also the word of the Lord in the day of Nephi was, There shall not any man among you have save it be one wife and concubines he shall have none. For I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, for if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people. Otherwise they shall hearken unto these things. At proper and appointed times the Lord has, of course, given the revelation and issued the command directing certain persons to enter plural marriage in the new and everlasting covenant. 1 Timothy 3.3 3. Not given to wine, nor striker, or bully, or violent person, not greedy and filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. President Spencer W. Kimball said, Now all money is not lucre. All money is not filthy. There is clean money, clean money with which to buy food, clothes, shelter, and other necessities and with which to make contributions toward the building of the kingdom of God. Clean money is that compensation received for a full day's honest work. It is that reasonable pay of faithful service. It is that fair profit from the sale of goods, commodities, and service. It is that income received from transactions where all parties profit. Filthy lucre is blood money, that which is obtained through theft and robbery. It is that obtained through gambling or the operation of gambling establishments. Filthy lucre is that had through sin or sinful operations, and that which comes from the handling of liquor, beer, narcotics, and those other many things which are displeasing in the sight of the Lord. Filthy lucre is that money which comes from bribery and from exploitation. Compromised money is filthy, graft money is unclean, 
Profits and commissions derived from the sale of worthy stocks are contaminated, as is the money derived from other deceptions, excessive charges, oppression to the poor, and compensation that is not fully earned. I feel strongly that men who accept wages or salary and do not give mensurate time, energy, devotion, and service are receiving money that is not clean. Certainly those who deal in the forbidden are recipients of filthy lucre. 1 Timothy 3, 4-6 through One that ruleth well with his house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, or recent convert, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Paul used the word neophyton to refer to one who is newly converted. This word is a compound of neos, new, recently born, and phio, which in the passive means to be born, to spring up, to grow, thus expressing the concept of a new convert or one newly born. A bishop, in particular, should be an experienced priesthood holder. 1 Timothy 3.7 Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without or outside the faith, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The title bishop is derived from the Greek word episkopos. Epi, which means over, as in the epicenter of an earthquake or the spot over which the quake centers, and skopos, meaning look or watch. Therefore, an escopos, or bishop, is one who watches over the flock as an overseer or supervisor. In 1 Timothy 3, 1-7, Paul listed several qualifications for men who were called as bishops, the attributes specified by Paul including vigilance, sobriety, generosity, and patience are valuable for all disciples of Jesus Christ, regardless of their calling. Speaking to bishops, President Gordon B. Hinckley identified similar qualifications needed for priesthood leaders in our day. You must be men of integrity. You must stand as examples to the congregations over which you preside. You must stand on higher ground so that you can lift others. You must be absolutely honest, for you handle the funds of the Lord. Your goodness must be as an ensign to your people. Your morals must be impeccable. The wiles of the adversary may be held before you because he knows that if he can destroy you, he can injure an entire ward. You must exercise wisdom in all of your relationships, lest someone read into your observed actions some taint of moral sin. You cannot succumb to the temptation to read pornographic literature, or even in the secrecy of your own chamber to view pornographic films. Your moral strength must be such that if ever you are called upon to sit in judgment on the questionable morals of others, you may do so without personal compromise or embarrassment. Paul listed qualifications for bishops in 1 Timothy 3, 1-7. How might these qualities be helpful for all saints to study and develop? Which of these attributes do you desire to obtain? Paul speaketh of deacons. 1 Timothy 3.8 Likewise, the deacons must be grave or honorable or dignified, not double-tongued or deceitful, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to deacons, said, One of the ordained offices of the Aaronic priesthood is that of a deacon. This office, the lowest of the priesthood hierarchy, is an appendage to the lesser priesthood. Deacons are appointed to watch over the church, to be standing ministers unto the church. They are to assist the teachers in all their duties, which includes home teaching, and are to warn, expound, exhort, and teach, and invite all to come unto Christ although they can neither baptize, administer the sacrament, or lay on hands. Among other things, it is the practice of the church to assign them to pass the sacrament, perform messenger service, act as ushers, keep church facilities in good repair, go home teaching, and perform special assignments at the direction of the bishopric. Many of their assigned functions are comparable to those performed by the Levites of old. It is the practice of the church in this dispensation, a practice dictated by the needs of the present-day ministry and confirmed by the inspiration of the Spirit resting upon those who hold the keys of the kingdom, to confer the Aaronic priesthood upon worthy young men who are twelve years of age and to ordain them to the office of a deacon in that priesthood. Notwithstanding the fact that this is the lowest priesthood office, it is yet a high and holy one 
in God's kingdom. In the meridian of time, the needs of the ministry were such that adult brethren were ordained deacons. 1 Timothy 3.9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Elder Bruce Summer Conkey, referring to mystery of the faith, said, Since the things of God are and can be known only by the power of the Spirit, they remain forever hidden, unknown, and mysterious to the carnal mind, to the mind enlightened by reason, but not by revelation. 1 Timothy 3.10-12 And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even women in like manner, so must their wives be grave or honorable or dignified, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. The word deacon comes from a Greek word meaning servant or minister. The office of deacon seems to have been a preparatory one because Paul did not prohibit a novice, a recent convert, from being called as a deacon, but did prohibit a novice from being called as a bishop. Other requirements for deacons were similar to those for bishops, including the requirement that deacons be the husbands of one wife. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, It was the judgment of Paul that a deacon in that day should be a married man. That does not apply to our day. Conditions were different in the days of Paul. In that day, a minister was not considered qualified to take part in the ministry until he was 30 years of age. Under those conditions, deacons, teachers, and priests were mature men. This is not the requirement today. There are, in all kinds of churches today, ministers who are under that age. And there is no requirement in the church in this dispensation that a person must be a matured man before he can take part in the ministry or hold the priesthood. Nor was it the rule in very ancient times. For we learn that Noah was only ten years of age when he was given the priesthood under the hands of Methuselah. 1 Timothy 3.13 For they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase, or earn, or acquire for themselves good standing rank, to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Great is the mystery of godliness. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Why is it that many men do not believe and accept the gospel? Why are there so few among the many who actually know and understand the doctrines of salvation? How is it that only a handful out of the billions of earth's inhabitants know the truth about God and his laws? Why is religion a hidden mystery to mankind generally? One of the main reasons is that religion is not a matter of reason alone. It is not based on or comprehended by the power of intellectuality. Because a man has a bright mind, because he is a profound scholar, because he knows or has discovered great truths in many of a hundred fields, does not mean he knows or understands religious truths. True religion comes from God by revelation. It is manifest to and understood by those with a talent for spirituality. It is hidden, unknown, and mysterious to all others. To comprehend the things of the world, one must be intellectually enlightened. To know and understand the things of God, one must be spiritually enlightened. One of the great fallacies of modern Christendom is turning for religious guidance to those who are highly endowed intellectually, rather than to those who comprehend the things of the Spirit, to those who receive personal revelation from the Holy Ghost. True religion, for instance, embraces the verity that God is a holy man, that we are his spirit offspring, that his firstborn in the Spirit was his only begotten in the flesh, that through faith men may become like Christ, that eternal life is gained through the continuation of the family unit in eternity. None of these truths are born of reason alone. All spring from revelation. None sinks into the heart of a true believer because of intellectual capacity. All have the ring of truth to those who are spiritually endowed, who are born again, who are alive to the things of the Spirit. 1 Timothy three fourteen through 16 these things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The pillar and ground or foundation of the truth is, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh 
justified by the or approved by the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory.